Hello, my name is Sabri Adel Sadi, and I am coordinator for Francophone Implementation at the Center for Research and Education on Violence Against Women and Children from Western University. On behalf of the Learning Network and the Knowledge Hub, I'd like to welcome you to our webinar on the origins of the Me Too movement uh, featuring Caroline Souffran. I'd like to acknowledge that uh, we are located on the traditional lands of the Anishinaabe, Haudenosaunee, Lenape, Wook, and Chonukton. These uh, lands are linked to the London Township Treaty of 17, 1796, as well as the Dish with One Spoon Wampum Belt Covenant. We are doing this land acknowledgement to counter the doctrine of discovery and to recognize indigenous lands and indigenous sovereignty. As a settler, I acknowledge the number of advantages that I have, and I would like to express my gratitude towards Mother Earth for the resources that we use, and I'd like to acknowledge all of the First Nations, Métis, and Inuit people who have lived on these lands for at least 15,000 years. Today, we're very happy to welcome Caroline Souffran, who is a social worker and a PhD candidate in social work at the University of Ottawa. She is currently doing a thesis on the Quebec manifestation of the Me Too movement with respect to women of African origin and African advocates. She is the author of the book, Privilege to Report Justice for All Victims of Sexual Violence. She was also appointed 2020 UN Fellow for People of African Descendants, and she is an independent columnist for a number of media sources. I will now pass her the floor so that she can begin our webinar. Hello, everyone. Can you hear me? Okay, yes. First of all, thank you for the warm welcome. It's very much a pleasure for me to talk to you about what I've been doing over the last few years and to speak to you about the Me Too movement, which is at the heart of my research. It's also something that's influenced me in writing my book, which came out uh, just about a year ago. And before I get started, I'd just like to say that we're going to be talking about some sensitive issues. We'll be talking about sexual violence and the efforts underway against it. If you need a break, if you need to leave the room that you're in to have a drink of water or whatever, please take care of yourselves. I won't be upset if you leave for a few moments. I understand this can be a delicate uh, topic for a number of people. So please take the time to do what's best for you without any type of shame. That's totally fine. I won't hold it against you. So I'm going to speak for about 45 minutes to an hour. We'll then take your questions. You can ask your questions to me in English or French. I speak both. I'll be doing the presentation in French. First of all, I'd like to explain a little bit about myself so that you can understand why I became interested in this subject, why I'm working in this area, and why I'm doing research on sexual violence experienced by women of African descent in Quebec. I'm going to explain the context in which the privilege of reporting was born. So that is to say, what was my creative process? What are my motivations for having written this book? And then I will talk about the genesis of the Me Too movement, which you probably are familiar with. It's from October 2017, but it goes, uh, it goes back uh, quite a number more, a uh, few more decades more. I'll talk about the situation in France, in Quebec, in the United States, and I will discuss to you some of some of the issues surrounding disclosure and reporting among Black and racialized women, those who have experienced sexual violence. What what are the specific issues and the shared issues among survivors of sexual violence in general? At the end, we'll discuss what justice is in this context. What exactly justice means? How justice can be had in these circumstances and how we can support this justice process as people who work with those who are survivors. So these are the things we're going to talk about today. I'm going to try to be concise. I won't go on 
at length too much, but I think it will be a, a good discussion. And then I'll be happy to answer your questions. We'll have plenty of time for questions. So if there's something that's unclear for you, please don't hesitate to ask me a question. So let's get started. Before I get started, I just like to give you some information about the terminology that I'm going to be using today, because sometimes we don't all understand these terms the same way. When I talk about disclosure, this is a person who's telling their story to their friends, family, a romantic partner, but it doesn't necessarily involve a formal complaint process. And when I talk about reporting, this is when a survivor decides to report what they've experienced to the police or to other institutions, and then a formal complaint process is triggered. So there's a difference between two, and survivors may do one or the other or neither of them, and I'll explain uh, some of the motivations behind this. So I really want to provide you with this context. Another term which I'm going to be using today or a concept, that is to say the continuum of sexual violence, which was put forward by Lise Kelly in the 1980s. Lise Kelly is a British feminist researcher, and she theorized something that brings us far away from a legal definition of sexual violence. Today, especially in Canada, we focus a lot on legal definitions set out in the criminal code. So since 1983, well, there are a number of sexual violence related offenses, including sexual assault, which has three levels of seriousness. And this has been the case since 1983. But there are also other definitions which exist, feminist definitions. And uh, her research was based on her, her interviews with a number of women. And her idea is that sexual violence can include all kinds of acts which are not necessarily which don't necessarily exist in a hierarchy and some acts which are not recognized by the criminal code for example can have uh, various serious repercussions for example a an insulting comment made in, on the street this is not something necessarily recognized by the criminal code in canada as an offense but it can have a significant uh, impact on someone so we need to understand this idea of a hierarchy of actions and the reason i say this is because there are some acts which are seen as being less serious for example as someone in the subway who is touched by someone and people will say that well this is not as bad as being raped at night uh, in an alley but what you need to understand is the person who experienced this in the subway if for this person there may be serious consequences as a result of their experience So this might uh, reactivate uh, traumas or there can be very negative emotions. The person may think about her previous experiences. So ultimately what this means is that this is a violation of our physical and psychological uh, bodies. And so we don't necessarily want to place uh, these types of acts within a hierarchy. Another thing that we need to understand regarding this continuum is that when we talk about the seriousness of actions compared with others, and I mentioned this in my book, is that it contributes to shame, the shame that many people will experience. So if someone experiences someone that's something that's considered less serious in our society, but if this person is affected by it, they may feel a great deal of shame if it's not something that's recognized by the legal system and they'll think that it's not serious. So it's important to take into consideration that if something like this occurs, regardless of the seriousness of the acts, the way people react to these things can be very different from one person to another. And it's important to take into consideration that regardless of what happens to us, if we think about it years later, and if it's something that, that disturbs us, well, that means that it's something that disturbed us and that uh, we have been violated in a certain fashion so we don't want to gaslight ourselves and this is something i mentioned in our book if we feel that our integrity has been violated well then that's the case and this is important in and of itself 
even if people say that certain things are serious, certain things aren't, if it's something that really disturbs us, well, it means that it is something that really disturbs us and it needs to be taken into consideration. So the experience of victims needs to be taken into, cons taken into consideration. We live in a society where we often we talk a lot about the law, and of course the law is important, but there are also other definitions of sexual violence which exists, and there are many ways to talk about it. It's not only from the point of view of the law that we can talk about uh, sexual violence. There are various other types of analysis which are completely valid and it depends on our point of view. It depends on the way that we want to talk about these issues. So that was just something that I thought was important to say. So during our webinar, I'm going to use the words victim and survivor interchangeably, and this is intentional. There's a reason why I'm using both of them. And in my writings, I, I use them in this interchangeable way because I think it's a kind of false dichotomy to oppose these two terms. Over the last few years, over the last few decades, within the feminist movement and in society at large, the term victim has been seen as being more pejorative. So some person might say that they're not a victim, they're a survivor. So victim has a certain negative connotation. However, I think that the term victim is very important when we talk about sexual violence, because if we're victim of something, that means that we were not responsible for the violence that we were subjected to. And when we experience sexual violence, it's very important that it's not our fault. We didn't provoke it. We're a victim. So we shouldn't completely reject this term. So it's very important to realize, again, that this is something that's not our fault. Many people who have experienced sexual violence feel a lot of shame and guilt. And in order to get rid of this shame and guilt, the first step is to realize that it's not our fault. So the term victim is very important. And the second reason that I use the term victim interchangeably with the word survivor is because survivors, well, victims of sexual violence who don't survive, strictly speaking, strictly speaking and figuratively speaking. And what I mean by that is that there are people when they experience sexual violence, some of them have survival strategies, which can be more damaging. Some die and some never recover from what they experienced. So the term victim is important to recognize these people who did not become survivors. And the term survivor, the reason that I also use it and the reason I read about it is because it refers to the notion of resilience. When we talk about a survivor, in generally, what this means is a person who has overcome obstacles and caused by sexual violence and who is leading a more or less normal life regardless of what happened. That being said, this can be the case. However, I believe that it oversimplifies the healing process when one experiences sexual violence. This is not a linear process where we go from being a victim and become a survivor. We can go around in circles. You can be a survivor one day, a victim the next. There are all kinds of times where we move forward and then move back. So it's not a linear process. It's a complicated process. And so I think sometimes we when we use the term survivor, we oversimplify how complicated the traumas experienced in these types of circumstances can be. And there's an expression that I like, which is used by Kalima Johnson. She is a social worker of uh, African descendants from the United States. She founded the Sasha Center, which is an organization that helps the victims of sexual violence in Detroit. She developed the, ex the expression, experiencer of sexual violence. So people who have experienced sexual violence. This is a way of emphasizing the fact that even if we've experienced sexual violence, we don't necessarily need to define ourselves by this experience by using the terms like survivor or victim. We can say that this is part of our journey, but it's just one thing among many.
which makes up our identity as a human. But ultimately, I think that it is up to each individual to self-define as he or she sees fit. This is not something that we can decide for a person who's experienced sexual violence. It's a personal choice. And people who experience sexual violence can decide to reject these terms completely. So it's something that belongs to everyone. And it's important to understand the nuance between these terms victims, victim and survivor, because they're very important in the area of sexual violence. And both are useful. And a person can even decide during their life to change the term that they use in referring to what's happened to them. So it's really a personal decision. This is something to take into consideration, but I really wanted to emphasize the nuance of this dichotomy between victim and survivor. So I've given you a bit of information about the terms that we're going to be using. And now we're going to get into the subject. As was mentioned earlier, my name is Caroline. Caroline Souffrant. I was born in 1992 in Montreal. My parents are Haitian. And as it was mentioned, I am a social worker by training and profession. So I have worked mostly in Quebec. That's where I grew up. And I work with many women who are, who are victims of sexual violence. I also work with homeless women. I work within the healthcare system and the social services sector in Quebec in, at a community level. And today I'm doing research. So I do research in social work. I did my undergrad in social work at McGill. I did my master's degree in social work at McGill as well. And I'm currently doing my PhD in social work at the University of Ottawa. My thesis, which I'm currently working on, and I hope it'll be ready by next year, has to do with the Me Too movement. And it has to do with uh, Afro feminist activists. So I interviewed uh, various uh, black women in Quebec who have been involved in the Me Too movement in one way or another, whether it's as activists, whether as volunteers, or whether it's professionally within their uh, work activities. So I wanted to understand how it is they experience this movement with in the mainstream Quebec feminist movement. There are many issues with respect to this. In Quebec, there are Afro-feminist activists. There are black women who have done a lot for Quebec and for Quebec's and Canada's society, but their stories are often invisibilized or erased, which is the reason I decided to focus my thesis on this particular question. And I decided to do it in French because there's not a lot of writing in French on the work of these women. So I'm also someone who in my book uh, discusses the fact that when I was younger, I was at high school and I was doing a program where we had to do some volunteer work. Some, it was mandatory to do this community service. So I got involved in a number of community activities in fundraising. And this is what made me interested in the area of social work. And that's why I decided to continue studying in the area. It's something that uh, is very important to me and it's very important for other people. It's also something that's uh, meaningful in terms of my involvement. So these are all the things that uh, brought me to work in this area and fo to focus on these questions. I work in many different areas, but ultimately I decided to focus my research on sexual violence. Very early in my life, I realized that it was a, an extremely serious problem. It, it is, in my opinion, a public health crisis. And even with the Me Too movement and other uh, reporting movements, this remains a serious problem. And I think that some people still stigmatize this problem and don't acknowledge its importance, especially among African uh, communities and other racialized communities. And I'll speak about that a little bit more in detail soon. If I could go to the next slide, please. So during my master's degree, as I said, I did it at McGill in social work. And 
my thesis was on Delphine Colleen Vezina, who is a researcher at McGill. And during my master's degree, I interviewed social workers, people who work at a community level, at a government level, people who work at a, a, a center that provides services to the victims of sexual violence in Quebec. So I took a look at various sectors, the public sector, the private sector, and the community sector to see what exactly it meant to respect a survivor's dignity when she reports having experienced sexual violence and what does it mean to not respect uh, this. I decided to take a look at this in a number of contexts. So within the legal system, within universities, schools, society as a whole, in the community sector. So we took a look at this question in various contexts and the results of this work, which I wrote in French because I was at McGill, really inspired the content of my book. So my book is based on my personal experience, on my research work, but also on my work as a professional, as a social worker. So these are all the things that uh, made me write my book. So if we go to the next slide, please. So here's the book. It's a, a rather small book, but it has a lot of content. It has 128 pages. So why? Why did I write this book? Why did I use this title? As I just said to you, I'm someone who just uh, was relatively recently a teenager and I, I've experienced sexual violence. In my case, it happened within the context of athletics. So it was this, it was a coach and I talk about it in my book, what exactly happened to me. So even if it's been a number of years that I've been working on sexual violence as a volunteer within my research and as also as a social worker, I didn't want to talk just about my story. I wasn't really ready to do so before 2020. And what happened in 2020, of course, there was the pandemic. And probably you recall the resurgence of the Black Lives Matter movement in May of 2020 with the death of George Floyd. And this is something that affected me as a, a Black person. To see this in the media was very disturbing to me, and that was the case for many uh, Black people. To see this movement and to see what happened with George Floyd. So, what you need to understand is that in Quebec, not only was there the, was there the resurgence of, of Black Lives Matter in May 2022, but in July 2022, 20, there was a new wave of, of reporting of sexual violence. As I said, Me Too happened in October 2017, but in Quebec, there were a number of other waves that happened before this in October 2017, and I'm going to talk about them a little bit later. There were a number of waves of reporting in Quebec, and in July of 2020, there was another one. So this reporting wave was very uh, significant. It uh, targeted very well-known people in Quebec and also people who were not so well-known. There were anonymous lists that were circulated. So it had a significant impact. It had legal consequences, social consequences, and about which I'll talk to you in a few moments. And so for me, within this context, with the two movements, which happened in short, in short succession, including the what happened in July of 2020. This awoke certain things in me, and I remembered the things I'd experienced, and I decided that I wanted to talk about it for the first time. So what I did was I wrote an open letter that was published in La Presse, which is a fairly well-known media source in Quebec. So I wrote this open letter in La Presse. It was published in July 2020. It was called The Funnel. And in this letter, I talked about my experience for the first time. We talked about what was going on in Quebec at the time. I never named anyone. And it's, this is not something that's important for me. But it was important for me to tell my own story. Because one of the criticisms that happens during any wave of reporting in Quebec is this question of representation. In the media, Often we see well-known white women, people who have a lot of privilege, whether it's economic or social, who 
speak on behalf of the Me Too movement and tell their stories. And I think, yes, that it's important that these women do so. But for me, the problem is that we didn't see other people. So the same thing happened in October 2017 when Me Too went viral. We saw a lot of Hollywood stars talk about these things. But when you take a look at the history of the movement and its origins, well, it really invisibilized many survivors. And if one people who experience sexual violence and for many reasons can't talk about it and who don't have access to the media and they aren't able to, for example, write a book to talk about it. So these, this is what I wanted to denounce in writing my book. This invisibilization of people of survivors who are not stars, who are not white, well-known women. And I wrote this book because in Quebec, there were many waves of reporting before Me Too, and there was another one after October of 2017. And so I wanted to discuss the various blind spots that existed when we took a look at what was being discussed in the media, while there were many things that weren't said or mentioned. And intellectually, there were a lot of shortcuts taken in terms of justice, what exactly justice was in terms of sexual violence. So I wanted to expand this debate by writing my book. And it's not a book that's academic. I am a researcher and a social worker, but it is a book that, uh, well, it's, it's a kind of essay. It reads uh, like a story. It's not fiction. And so I really wanted to make uh, these ideas uh, comprehensible to the average person so that the majority of people could understand its content. It's 122 pages, and I didn't want it to be too long. I wanted it to be concise, clear, and accessible to the majority of people. And the book doesn't claim to answer or resolve uh, all the questions that exist. Uh, its goal is simply to expand the scope of the debate on this question of who is the victim of sexual violence and what justice is. So I wanted to open the door to discussions with this book. As was said recently, the book came out in Quebec and in Europe, so in France, Belgium, and Switzerland. And up until now, the reception has been very positive. I was very surprised. And it's been nominated for a Montreal prize. So things are going well with the book. It's been well received and people are, have heard what I've had to say. It's really helped people. And that was my goal, in fact, to help at least one single person in the course of this process. And I believe I was able to accomplish this goal. In fact, I even exceeded my expectations. So it's really in that context that I wrote the book. And uh, these are the reasons why I wrote the book. So now, Let's move on. Let's give some context to the Me Too movement and let's explain the genesis of this movement. So the person that you're seeing on the screen is Terena Burke. She is the founder of the Me Too movement and uh, she's centered her work, her activism on sexual violence uh, against black and uh, brown women and girls. So she's a community organizer, she's a, a community worker. So here is an extract of her biography in Unbound that came out in 2021. And she says that sexual violence doesn't discriminate, but the response to it does. In some ways, it's something that doesn't discriminate based on social class or on people. But what will be different will be the reaction that's uh, given based on the person's profile or journey. So even though this is something that affects everyone, everywhere in the world, in all environments, uh, it's everywhere. It, there's, there's nowhere that it's spared, but it's the reaction to or the response to the sexual violence that differs. And what she says is that this is why she tried to center her work on Black people particularly women and girls, because the response to this topic in those communities is quite different than the response uh, to white women's 
So that was her motivation. And I'll talk about uh, the context of that a little bit later. But as I've said earlier, when uh, Me Too went viral in 2017, Temer Burke was made invisible. And here she is in an interview with the uh, French magazine Le Monde with the independent journalist uh, Christelle Merhela. So Tarana Burke is the one on the bottom. She said, if Me Too became vir viral, it's because the victims were very privileged women, rich, famous, and above all, white. Even black celebrities weren't included in the movement because there were some black women who denounced uh, Harvey Weinstein, who was uh, at the center of the Me Too uh, movement in 2017, but they weren't put forward. And we have to keep that in mind because really it's something that's related to uh, class, to race. And it's important when we're talking about the Me Too movement, because when we look at the origins of the movement, there's really a big gap between the early roots of the movement and what it became in 2017. Something else. This is Josh Nike, who is a Cameroonian columnist based in Paris. And what she says about Tarana Burke is this. She has been rendered invisible, and this raises the question of the legitimacy of the stories. It was complicated to imagine that a Black woman in her 40s was behind one of the most important social movements of the century, universal to all women. So once again, it's about who's included in the Me Too movement and why. And, and really here we can see that there is some exclusion, and I talk about it in my book as well. So this is something I wanted to broach. You know, nowhere was Tamara Burke mentioned, not in the newspapers or elsewhere, because, and, and yet she was the founder of the movement. So I wanted to remind people what the origins of this movement was, were, and what the context was. And I wanted to explain, as I said uh, earlier, it's uh, Tamara Burke, Tarana Burke, who founded the movement, but people don't really know why she founded the movement. So as I've said earlier, Tarana Burke is a community organizer. She's not a public uh, person. She's a community worker who worked uh, with youth, uh, especially uh, underprivileged youth in the United States. And in 1997, she was a day camp supervisor. So she worked with racialized and low-income girls there was a young girl, 13, who was who she's called Heaven, who was attending this day camp. Heaven was known for her strong temperament. She was a bit difficult. You, she always had issues. You know, she had a very strong character and she was considered difficult. And one day, Heaven reached out to Tarana so she could speak to her privately. So Tarana listened and Heaven told her that she was experiencing sexual violence uh, from her mother's boyfriend. And we need to know that at that time, Tarana Burke had already been a survivor of sexual violence. She's spoken about it before. She has uh, been sexually uh, assaulted several times in her life. And when she was listening to Heaven, she felt that she was unable to do it. It was too much for her. So she rejected Heaven. And, and after just a few minutes, and that's what she explains, she wasn't able to listen to her, to her confidences. It was too much for her. So Heaven looked heartbroken. She left the day camp and she never came back. So up to today, Tarana has no idea what happened to Heaven. She doesn't know if she's still alive today, how she's doing. She has no idea what happened to Heaven. And this is a regret she's had uh, forever uh, to not have been able to listen to what this young girl was telling her. It was so important and to not be able to support her the way that she would have liked to. So 10 years later, in 2006, Tarana Burke founded an organization called Just Being in the United States. She also had a platform on MySpace. Uh, I think MySpace doesn't exist anymore, but at the time uh, she had a platform on that and she founded the Me Too movement, the Me Too campaign. And what she would have liked to do with Heaven is to reply, Me Too. I've also lived sexual violence. I've also experienced sexual violence. That's where the Me Too comes from. The fact that she couldn't tell Heaven me too. 
So that's what Me Too means. And Tarana Burke said that that movement is something that promotes empowerment through empathy. So it's a show of solidarity before, between survivors. It's a way of saying, you've lived it, I've lived it. It shows solidarity. It brings community around people who have survived sexual violence. And this is at a time when people weren't reporting. So it's solidarity between survivors. And it was a movement that was centered on women and girls uh, from Black communities and who often don't have the money or the funds, uh, whether it be political or money, to uh, pursue the issue. So that was the origin of the Me Too movement. And that's really why Tamara, uh, Tarana created the Me Too movement. So what you might know a little bit more is the Me Too movement that uh, started in 2017. So to give you a little bit of context and give you a bit of a reminder, there were two investigations done, one by the New York Times on October 5th, 2017, and the second by the New Yorker on October 10th. And that was on uh, Harvey Weinstein. So he's a producer in Hollywood who was uh, very influential, had a lot of power. And these two investigations revealed that over several decades, Harvey Weinstein, uh, and actually he was uh, indicted and uh, went to jail later, but he had um, sexually harassed, sexually assault many, many women, uh, mostly actresses, especially white actresses. There was one black actress, uh, Lupita Nyong'o, who uh, had uh, stated that Harvey Weinstein had assaulted her. But at the end of the day, there were around 100 women who were accusing Harvey Weinstein of assaulting them sexually. So it's quite a big list of people reporting uh, celebrities, people who were influential in Hollywood. And in that context, October 15th, uh, you know, we're, we've actually just passed the sixth anniversary of the uh, um, keyword. So Alyssa Milano is uh, an actress. She played in Charmed. Uh, it's something I uh, listened to when I was a kid. It was uh, Three Witches. So October 15th, 2017, Alyssa wrote on Twitter, if you were sexually assaulted or sexually harassed, write Me Too to answer this tweet. And the objective was to see how many people would raise their hand to say, Me Too, I've experienced this violence. So she was able to show the magnitude of the problem. She wanted to see how many people were going to reply and what the prevalence of the issue was. And as you know, it went viral. So in 24 hours uh, after the hashtag, Me Too became a transnational movement. So in France, it was Balanston Par, in Quebec, Moisy, Italy, Spain, China, Norway, Vietnam, Tunisia, Iran, and Russia, just to name a few. So this became a transnational movement who, which took different forms based on the geogra geographical and political contexts. So what we need to know is that when Alyssa Milano sent her out her tweet, there are several people on the internet that started to state that Tarana Burke had been working on that for more than 10 years, that she had also used uh, this hashtag uh, Me Too to talk about sexual violence, and that originally it was uh, for women and girls coming from Black communities. So Tarana said that Alyssa called her, apologized. She had no idea who Tarana was. She didn't know her story. And she proposed to support her in her media initiatives. And as we've seen, Alyssa Milano immediately stepped back and gave the platform to Tarana Burke. So I really don't think she knew who Tarana was. Uh, and it's really great what she did. Uh, she gave back the word to the movement's founder and let her speak. And that's an important gesture because if she hadn't done that, I'm not sure that we would know who Tarana Burke is today because uh, she wasn't a celebrity. She wasn't someone who was well known. She did not have the same power as Alyssa Milano. But the fact that Alyssa Milano recognized her as the founder of the movement and showed solidarity for her work uh, 
means that today we know who Tirana is. Would that have happened if Elisa Milano had decided not to do that? I'm not sure. But I think it would definitely have been harder for Tirana Burke to uh, have the recognition she deserves. So that's that. As I said earlier, in Canada, especially in Quebec, there was a huge impact from this movement. So as I've said earlier, in Quebec, there were several waves of reporting uh, of sexual violence. So here we have a Statistics Canada report. And what we can see is that after the movement had reached its peak, there was an increase in Canada of 24% in reporting to police across the country, everywhere. And in Quebec, this was 61% of an increase. So that's the highest percentage in Canada for a province. And when it comes to the cities, where we saw the highest percentage of reporting after the Me Too movement, we're talking about Quebec City, Sherbrooke, which is a Quebec City, Saguenay, also in Quebec, Montreal, and Brantford in Ontario. So there was quite a strong impact in Quebec. In Quebec, we have the Calax uh, who uh, help people who have uh, experienced sexual violence. And there are several Calax across the province. And we also have the Regroupement Québécois, which represents uh, pretty much all the centers across Quebec. And in the two weeks following Elisa Milano's tweet, the uh, FQ Calax had seen an increase of 100 to 533 percent of people asking for help. And that's in the two weeks following Alyssa Milano's tweet. And that impact is still felt in Quebec. And as I said earlier, there were several waves of reporting in Quebec. There were several between before October 2017. So at the beginning of the uh, 2000s, there was Nathalie Simard and uh, Guy Cloutier. Uh, Guy Cloutier was uh, this impresario. He was well known. Uh, Nathalie Simard was a singer in the 1980s. And Guy Cloutier was basically her manager. So she reported him in the uh, beginning of 2000s. And that had a high impact, and it uh, meant that there were more requests put into the Calax. There was the movement Been Raped, Never Reported, in uh, the context of the Gomishi affair. That was a little bit more uh, at the Canadian level. In 2016, in Quebec, there was also Stop Culture du Viol, Stop Rape Culture. So there was Alice Paquet a Jerry Sclerunos. Alice Paquet is a young woman who reported a deputy from the National Assembly. And at Laval University, there had been cases in the student residences of uh, sexual assaults that were portrayed in the media. There had also been uh, Indigenous women in Val d'Or, which is a Quebec region, who had reported on TV during a documentary uh, on Radio-Canada, had uh, reported that a policeman had assaulted them. And this is in Val d'Or in Quebec. And that had uh, quite caused quite the stir. So all that was going on at the same time. So hashtag Stop Culture du Viol uh, was born in 2016 under that context. In 2020, uh, July 2020, as I said earlier, we had another wave of reporting which didn't have a specific hashtag, but which was quite important because there was a demarked difference between July 2020 and the previous waves. In July 2020, what was observed was that victims and survivors were specifically naming the people they were accusing, whether there had it had gone to trial or not, there were lists that were circulating on social media. There was a, a website that was called Say His Name, where there was a list of people accused of sexual assault who hadn't necessarily gone to trial or uh, followed a judicial process. So that's a big distinction between uh, that wave and the previous ones. And today, these women have uh, managed these web pages. They were, but then they were uh, pursued uh, for a defamation suit, and it's still uh, in the court system. So this is something that's new. But what we're seeing in Canada and also elsewhere 
is that there's been an increase uh, in defamation uh, lawsuits against people who are reporting on social media uh, sexual assaults and sexual violence. I'm going to try to speed up a little bit. One of the cases that I talk about in my book, and this is from another generation, I wasn't born when this happened, the woman you see on screen is Anita Hill. Anita Hill was an intern in law in United States. She worked for Clarence Thomas, who is now a Supreme Court judge in the United States. So there was a power relationship between the two. So Anita Hill, who was uh, the intern for Clarice Thomas, had reported him for sexual harassment at the time. She had to uh, act as a witness in front of millions of Americans, in front of a white panel uh, composed of men, white men only. And Clarence Thomas was still uh, named to the Supreme Court, and he's still there today. Anita Hill today is a university professor. She continues speaking so even though Clarence Thomas was uh, recognized, uh, was named to the Supreme Court, this had a huge impact uh, to make people aware of sexual harassment in the workplace. So that was a great contribution made by Anita Hill and that she continues making. And at the time, it had really divided the Black community because Anita Hill is a Black woman, Clarence Thomas is a Black man. He's the second black man to sit on the Supreme Court in the United States. And that had really divided the community at the time. Some people saw it as a private attack that shouldn't have been uh, told in public. So she really paid a high, high price for this. But it really helped a lot of people to become aware collectively. And there was a similar case uh, that happened in 2018. And that's a uh, Christine Blasey Ford of it with uh, Brent Kavanaugh. That's a very similar story. And I also talk about it in the book. Another case that was uh, really talked about in the media is uh, Nafisatou Diallo Diska. So that's uh, Denis, D Dominique Toscan. He was uh, the IMF ruler. He was a white man. He was uh, he was uh, someone who was felt could be president of France at the time. And um, Nafisa Tou, she was uh, she was a cleaner in the hotel when she came to Canada. She didn't speak English, and she worked in a very prestigious hotel in New York. So she accused. Dominique Strauss-Kahn, so DSK, of having assaulted her sexually in a hotel room. So the case uh, went viral internationally in France and Canada. I remember I was younger, but I remember uh, seeing that on TV. And it had a Im powerful impact on her life. So how was this resolved? Well, there was a financial agreement between the two parties, uh, which ended the uh, legal the legal lawsuit. But 10 years later, she uh, talked to Paris Match, which is a French magazine, and she said that that case had ruined her life, that she had said the truth, and that she had been deprived of justice. So it's really important to remember this woman because she also contributed to the woman to the movement and we're talking about 2011 so several years before 2017 so now let's talk about potential issues surrounding disclosure and reporting for black and racialized women so i've talked about anita hill clarence thomas at the time some people of the from the black community from the afro-american community thought she was betraying their community so we have a black man who is the second black man to sit on the Supreme Court bench, which is the highest uh, tribunal in the country. So it's something that's prestigious. It's something that uh, makes the community proud. And here we have a black woman who's reporting this man for sexual harassment. And that divided the community at the time. But several black women recognized themselves in Anita Hill and supported her publicly. So. There was uh, Dinomik Krencha, who had uh, supported Anita Hill at the time. So when it comes to the issue of betraying the community, something that's quite important for the Black community, it's seen as something that shouldn't be publicly discussed. It's uh, private. We have to protect the community, quote unquote. 
So there were several people who decided to not talk about it so they could protect their community, quote unquote, but also to avoid criticism from other people within the community. And I think it would be the same thing if we uh, do um, reporting within a family, you know, there's a lot of different power uh, structures uh, and it's often the people who are reporting who are, um, who fall to the wayside. There was also the fear of reinforcing stereotypes around the sexuality of black women and men whereby black women are more available, uh, quote unquote. And for black men, there's the myth of the uh, black man who's the aggressor, who's uh, raping white women. And uh, this is something that's uh, perceived in the United States and also in Canada by uh, white people. So there's all these stereotypes and by saying something, we could reinforce the stereotype involuntarily, whether it be in the media or elsewhere. Uh, the stereotype of uh, black men and women when it comes to sexual violence, and it's hard. This is like a load to carry when it comes to this. Sometimes people will say, it, it's like that in their community, it's like that in their culture, but in reality, violence, sexual violence exists everywhere. Canada is no better than elsewhere. And we stigmatize specific communities, and even though it happens everywhere. And then there's the potential language related issues. So if we don't uh, master French or English, uh, based on where we live in Canada, it could be hard to access services to be understood when we tell our story. There's also the fear of losing one's uh, immigration status. Some women are actually threatened with that that they'll be deported if they speak up, if they talk about what they experienced. And if they have a precarious work, they're afraid of losing their job. Let's say that they were assaulted by a boss or a superior. There's also uh, common issues. For example, the fear of not being believed or taken seriously. There's shame, taboo, modesty. You know, this is an intimate thing there's the fear of being rejected by loved ones, by friends, by family. And there's also the issue of homophobia, transphobia, etc. So there's all these issues uh, that are common to all uh, survivors of uh, sexual violence, but some are a little bit more pronounced in certain communities that are racialized or black, for example. All right, moving on. So Karima Johnson, I, I talked about her earlier. She founded the Sasha Center in the United States. She's a social worker. She developed this model with the community with whom she works. It's called the Sasha model, Black Women's Triangulation of Rape. So this is a model that explains why there is vi sexual violence towards Black women. So there's victim blaming, there's the politics, uh, there's the financials, the policies and funding, there's the societal barriers. There's also the oppression, the slavery, the institution. So it's really an interesting model because she shows the more individualized dimensions as well as structural dimensions. So the ones that are more political and historical and that explain why there's so much sexual violence towards Black women up to today. So that's an interesting model. And another thing I speak about in the book is the various functions of silence. Because when there were the waves of reporting, when we, Me Too happened, well, in Quebec, we saw a lot of politicians and even journalists, uh, social workers who said, we have to report, we have to speak up, we have to ask for help. So we insisted upon the fact that we have to talk about it. And I wanted to add some nuance to that uh, question of wanting to speak about it right away. Because once we speak, there's a price to pay. Writing this book has cost me something in my life. So there's always an associated cost when we speak up. So I wanted to add some nuance by saying that sometimes when we stay quiet or when we decide not to report publicly or to uh, the police, well, 
in a certain way, we're keeping control of what we've experienced on the narrative that's associated to that. So there's power in deciding who we will be telling our story, how we will be doing it, why we will do it, and what details we want to share and reveal. There's power and control in that decision. When we're in front of the court, we have to say everything in all details. And it's very, very intrusive. And sometimes we have to decide, we want to decide to keep stuff for ourselves and talk to people that we trust only. And there is a power to that choice. Not all victims will speak up and have something positive happen afterwards. And for some victims, it's more costly to speak up. That said, when we don't speak up, it's true that it does have an impact. It creates uh, what we call the rape culture. So it protects aggressors. It uh, hides these violences. It and it, it makes uh, sure that it, 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 it uh, makes that the um, aggressor is goes unpunished. So even though there were Americans who were privileged who spoke up, they had to pay a certain price. But thankfully, they enabled us to have a social conversation that we're having today. So I don't want to criticize the fact that privileged women spoke up uh, when it came to the Me Too movement. What they did was important because it helps us to discuss this issue today. But we have to spread empathy, share empathy with everyone. That's what I want to say. And when we're talking about uh, silencing people, well, this is a reference to defamation lawsuits against uh, survivors speaking out on social media and in the public space. As I've said earlier, more and more, we see we see women who have spoken up on social media, who have named their aggressor, and are being uh, are being pursued at the civil level, and that uh, privatizes the violence. So since June 2020 in Quebec, when we had the waves of reporting, many many women have seen defamation lawsuits against them. And there hasn't been as many uh, reportings. And that's probably because having seen so many women uh, be pursued and seeing the consequences in their life have has discouraged people from speaking up. So it has reprivatized sexual harassment. So silence has several functions. We have to nuance what we, what we say when we say we have to denounce uh, at all costs, we have to speak up, we have to be brave. I think there's several ways of being brave. And there's not one way that's better than another. So it's important to think of that. So what is justice in such a context? In Quebec, anyway, and in Canada, when we talk about sexual violence and victims' rights, it always coincides with increased state power in the area of criminal criminal prosecutions. It's the case in Canada and the United States. When victims speak up to seek justice, what we hear from the politicians is that we need to have longer and more serious sentences. We need to change the legal system. That's what we hear from politicians. So systems are very punitive and relate to imprisonment. So in the book, I wanted to talk about this. Justice is something that's very complicated. It has many dimensions. For me, the fact that I wrote this book, well, for me, it was a tool for justice. I didn't make a complaint to the police, but it made me feel like I'd, I'd had justice because I told my story using my terms. I controlled my narrative. I was heard. I was listened to, validated. And so justice can mean different things. It's not just com making a complaint to the police and having someone be imprisoned. It can mean other things. And so it was important that I discuss the nuance, the nuances of this question. Currently in Quebec, there are many, uh, there are many courts that are going to be put into place that will be able to better take into consideration the experiences of the victims of spousal or sexual violence. And it was seen as a breach of trust. If uh, victims report on social media, it's because they don't trust the legal system to 
provide them with any kind of justice. So the government's response in Quebec was that there would be specialized courts established so that victims would no longer use social media and that they would use the traditional justice system. So in the book, another thing that I wanted to say is that for many survivors, in many cases, victims are assaulted by someone that they know, perhaps a, 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 someone who's in their entourage. So the idea of putting this person in prison is not necessarily what they want to do. So it's a question of reestablishing trust in the legal system. But ultimately, this uh, system doesn't reflect what these victims uh, want to see as justice. And for many survivors, putting someone in prison is not justice. So there are other things that exist. Yes, there can be some kind of civil remedy. There can also be restorative justice processes, transformative justice processes. And for some survivors, speaking out on social media can also be a legitimate, a legitimate way to be heard. Many have taken this decision because they didn't want to make a complaint to the police or to other institutions formally. Or rather, they did so, but these institutions didn't to give them any kind of justice. So social media was their last resort. It's also important to take into consideration, as I said, no one is obliged to do any of these things to get justice. Speaking to healthcare professionals, to loved ones, workers, or being an advocate or having an artistic process like mine, all of these things are legitimate and neither of them are better than, none of them are better than others. It's simply a way to undertake one's healing process. So this is something they need to take into consideration. There are many ways of obtaining justice, and it's not just going to the police and putting someone in prison. We really need to expand what we mean by justice, because it can mean many things, and it's something that's very important. So I believe this is my last slide. Some possible interventions. Of course, we have to believe the victim. And what I mean by this is that when we take a look at our statistics on the number of people in our society who have been victims of sexual violence. The UN talks about one third of women, and this is an estimation, perhaps a conservative one. Probably the numbers are higher. It's very likely that a woman who says they were assaulted was in fact assaulted. And sometimes people talk about false accusations against men. Yes, of course, they can happen. But honestly, men are more likely to be victim of sexual violence than to be the victims of false accusations. So the Me Too movement is against sexual violence, and it's not a movement against men. That's something that needs to be taken into consideration. Yes, there are more women who are victims, but men, men are also victims, and they're more likely to be victims of sexual violence than to be falsely accused. And if you want to help a survivor, you need to explore different options. So if we do such and such thing, here's what can be what could be good about it, here's what could be bad about it. We need to be we need to take into consideration that there are always going to be certain things that are unpredictable. Nothing is guaranteed. And with the person, you should do a cost benefit analysis of what the person wants and to determine what the best way would be to get them what they want in terms of justice. And it can evolve over time. That's something that needs to be taken into consideration for black women and racialized women. Anti-black racism, misogyny, these things can have an impact on who is seen as being a legitimate victim, someone who, whether someone's believed or listened to. And ultimately, people need to be able to make their own decisions. Something that's very unfortunate is that when some sexual violence is reported, it can have a very significant impact on the healing process subsequently. So people need to be able to make their own decisions and they need to be supported in the context of what they want to do. And of course it can change over time. And for me, that was the case at the beginning. I didn't want to talk about it. It took me 10 years and then I wrote a book. So things can change over time based on one's uh, journey through life. And that's completely normal. We should also recognize that people may feel a certain ambivalence about their decisions. Perhaps the person wants to do something, but they, they're uncertain. 
when I wrote this book, I was very afraid, I, and that's completely normal. So having this kind of ambivalence or doubt about these decisions is totally normal. And something that needs to be taken into consideration is that for all victims of sexual violence, they have the same fundamental needs to be believed, to be heard, listened to, recognized, validated, supported in daily activities, and they need to have a community around them. Even if there are specific details regarding black victims, at the end of the day, everyone who experiences sexual violence needs these things. These are fundamental needs for victims of crime in general, but especially for victims of sexual violence. So that's it for me. Here's some resources. I think that you have the PowerPoint. So now we can move on to questions. I spoke a lot longer than I thought I was going to. So thank you for your attention. Thank you very much for your presentation. And thanks for making it all very understandable in terms of your research. So we'll now move to our question period and uh, my colleague will help me with that. The First question, are there any resources on from organizations that work in the area of sexual violence against the people from the black community, whether it's in Quebec or Ontario? I know a center that was founded and is managed by survivors. It's based in Ontario, but it exists throughout the country. I'm not sure if it's in all provinces. In Quebec, uh, there are certain initiatives that have been organized by activists to help uh, black survivors. But in Canada, this uh, women's center is very important and they do significant research, which is called This research center is doing some countrywide research on violence experienced by members of the Black community in Canada, and I'm on their advisory committee. So I'd be interested in seeing what what this will end up being. Thank you. Uh, so I will ask the next question. Um, it has to do with policy and, and law, but I will tie it to the comment. There was a comment in the chat. So I'll read the comment and I'll ask the question. You can tie them together. So one person stated that it is interesting that the pri private law, and I can put it in the chat as well, um, that the private lawsuits against women are quite successful, yet criminal charges against perpetrators are so rarely useful. Mm -hmm. I have heard it suggested that bringing civil charges for damages to perpetrators may be a much more effective way to charge them. Even though it wouldn't result in a criminal record, it is more likely to result in actual reparations and in perpetrators of violence actually having to pay, in quotation, in some way. So what are your thoughts? I'll put it in the chat as well, in the comment um, section. Yeah, so um, the, I think one of the main reasons why uh, civil lawsuits are against women, uh, that women are doing, right? Or that women are targeted by. I'm not sure I understand the question correctly. I just put it in the chat. Okay. Um, but it really lines up to a, a, a more simpler question, and I can just read that out if that makes better sense. You know, mm -hmm. how have legal and policy changes, if any, in Canada mm -hmm. um, influenced this movement, the Me, the Me Too movement in Canada? Um, yeah, so uh, the, the thing I, I wanted to say to just to answer the part on uh, civil lawsuits is that um, the burden of proof is not the same that uh, in a criminal uh, case, um, in a criminal case, it's uh, without a reasonable doubt. And in a civil lawsuit, it's more a, a balance of uh, which version is more probable of being true. Um, so I think that's why there's a difference there. Um, and yes, I think the Me Too movement has really had an impact on many, uh, many changes that happen in law. Um, I can speak for Quebec because that's where I'm from. 
um, before the Me Too movement and for civil lawsuits, um, you only had 30 years to actually um, like sue the person that um, assaulted you. Uh, and now that's been abolished. So there's no time frame or time limit to sue someone that's been abolished in 2017. We also had uh, in universities and colleges, we have a, now uh, a law that forces all universities and colleges in Quebec to have um, a, a protocol on how to prevent sexual violence and also how to intervene if something happens. It's not perfect, but it's there, something that happened, I, I assume because of the movement. That was also in 2017. Um, and also like the specialized uh, tribunals that are being put in place in Quebec for uh, sexual violence and conjugal violence. Uh, it's not perfect. I don't think it will solve everything, but I do believe strongly that these changes would not have happened without all the survivors that came forward on social media. It's really a response to that because there were so many um, Me Too waves in Quebec and also elsewhere that at least in Quebec, they try to do something to show that the, they take their, that they take this seriously, that they want to do something about it, which is, I don't think that would have happened without all these survivors coming forward. Um, so yes, it had an impact. Yeah. Thank you. On a une autre question, uh, Caroline. Another question for you, Caroline. In your opinion, how? Can we promote uh, Black women's efforts in this area on a daily basis? Well, I think we need to support Black women who are working in the area. There aren't many of us, but we do exist. For example, women at the center, as I mentioned recently, there are also researchers. The first one that comes to mind is Petrina Duhaney. She has done research on spousal violence, and it's related to the criminalization of Black women in Canada. So there are researchers doing things. I think that uh, we can support what they're doing, make them visible. And of course, having historians who could focus on the contribution of black women in Canada, well, these people exist too, but we need to make what's already been done in the area more visible. When I arrived at, at university, I was surprised to see what had been done or, or the fact that many things about black Canadians weren't being taught. So we need to include these people in uh, coursework, uh, invite these people to speak uh, in front of students, make the initiatives that exist already more visible. Community ones, academic ones, research ones. So that's what I'd say. There are black pioneers who have done a lot in Canada, but they're much less visible. Thank you for your answer. Thank you. So I will have the next question for you, Caroline. Okay. Um, can you share any recommendations or action points for those who want to be allies mm -hmm. or advocates for Black women within the context of the Me Too movement? And you can speak to it in a uh, uh, context of what you know in Quebec or in Canada mm -hmm. as a well. whole. Mm -hmm. Um, that's a good question. I think sometimes um, it's important to understand that um, we not, might not be the best person to help someone. So if someone wants to speak to another Black woman about this issue, uh, sometimes you just have to accept that um, that woman doesn't necessarily feel safe to share that with, with an, another white woman, for example. So I guess that's a way to, to be an ally, to, to support um, spaces that are by and for Black women survivors. So I think that's a way to support them, um, either financially or just sometimes just accepting that um, we're not necessarily the best person to support that person, that the person who needs help. Um, and sometimes also one thing that I find interesting is that um, we very often when there's something going on, we feel the need to, to talk and to take space. Sometimes it's important to leave the space to, for other people to speak, um, especially like when I think of some public personalities uh, who take a lot of space. Um, when you're, you, you have a voice and that it, it echoes a lot in society, sometimes you can just leave the stage to someone else or refer someone else or this person might be better suited to talk about this instead of me. So I think it's important sometimes to um, 
put the spotlight on someone else um, and also accept that we might not always be the best person to help someone that uh, sometimes they prefer to speak with someone who has a more uh, close experience to theirs. And that does, it, it might feel uncomfortable, but I think sometimes we, we have to accept that we're not the best ones. Uh, and also uh, financially, like you can support organizations. Uh, they always need money. So you can always um, support those organizations either financially or, or yeah, and sometimes like just giving the spotlight to someone else. I think it's important to learn to do that as feminists because uh, just, yeah, I think it's, it's a skill that you have to do when to talk and when you people need to leave space to other people. Yeah. Merci, Caroline. Uh, je sais que tu as abordé ça un peu vers Ooh. la fin de ta présentation. Thank you, Caroline. I know you've talked about it slightly at the end of your presentation, but there's something, uh, a question that came back. How can workers better support uh, Black women and girls who have survived or been uh, victims of uh, sexual violence? What advice would you have? Well, is to keep in mind that even though there are specificities that are quite clear for a Black person, there are particular issues that I've spoken about, I think we need to keep in mind that we need to support them, we need to believe them, we need to validate them, we need to accompany them. There has to be people around her who support her and who believe her. This is fundamental for anyone who's experiencing sexual violence. And I think that's the foundation. And as I've said earlier, it's, you know, it might not be the most important need in this present time, but it's to see how can we do a cost, uh, a cost ratio analysis and how can we help the person decide what she's going to do? What would uh, work? What are the consequences of a certain choice or a certain decision? To basically see how far do you want to pursue this? How uh, how much do you want to risk? We do the uh, cost analysis uh, ratio and then we let her make her own choice. So basically supporting the person's self-determination. It's not everyone that wants to report something to the police and we have to respect that. For some people, it's just not a valid option. So how can this person get justice in other ways. There are other kinds of justice that exist. There could be an artistic uh, approach that's used. Uh, there's so many ways that are valuable. So we can look at various scenarios with the person, see what's important to her, do a cost uh, analysis of everything, uh, what would be the advantages, what would be the disadvantages of this decision, and explore everything with that person, and then let her make her own choice. Thank you. So before I uh, hand over the mic, you were talking about uh, restorative and transformative justice. Would you have organization names in Quebec, Ontario, Canada that you could uh, give us? Well, the first name I can think of in Montreal, there's the Thir Third Eye Collective. So I mentioned it in my book. This is a collective of Black women who uh, work on transformative justice. It's a hard process, very demanding. And in Quebec, there's Equi Justice, which is a grouping of institutionalized organizations who work on restorative justice when it comes to sexual violence. And they're doing it more and more because there are victims who come to see them and who request that service. I don't know what else is in other province, but I know it's out there. Sometimes it's done informally, but without uh, being named specifically that. But, uh, you know, even if you don't hear restorative justice or transformative justice, it's something sometimes that's managed between people because they don't trust institutions to help them. So there's always been ways to manage these types of situations. But the two organizations uh, I can think of, I just named in Quebec. Thank you. Thank you, Caroline. Again. Thank you, uh, Carolyn. Um, I think mine is similar to this question that came uh, forward. It's also asking for your opinion or recommendation. So um, we would like if you could share recommendation or action points uh, for 
those who want to, oh, I think I did ask that. Somebody yeah, switched yeah, my question, yeah. Army. <laughs> my apologies. I'll take that back. Um, so what are some of the pressing issues or areas that need further attention and action within the Me Too movement as it pertains to Black women? Uh, so whether in Quebec or you can speak to, to uh, nationally as well. Mm -hmm. So yes, what are yeah. some of the present issues? Just a few that you could um, highlight for us. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so uh, I, it's funny because I didn't speak about that at all in the presentation, but I speak about, I have a whole chapter about it in the book. Um, oh, I think raising awareness towards young people um, because I think the discussion right now is really focused on what we do after it has happened, but we don't talk as much about how can we prevent it from happening in the first place. And that means um, talking to young people about these things, obviously with terms that are adapted to their age and development. Uh, and there are experts who do that uh, as a job. Um, so it's possible to do it, but I think we, there needs to be really like a political push and a will to raise awareness towards young people across Canada. Because right now at the moment, uh, when it comes to um, like sex ed or like awareness of these things for young people, and schools is very, um, it's not uniform across different provinces or even across different schools. Um, it's not always evaluated. So we don't always know what's being taught to these kids, um, who is teaching these, these things to these kids, if it's being taught. Um, so I think there needs to be a whole reflection about um, how can we prevent it from happening in the first place. And for me, that means being truthful to young people about these things because. Sometimes we feel like, oh, if we don't talk about this, it won't happen, but it might happen even if you don't talk about it. But at least if you explain to the youth that it can happen, if it does happen to them, they will know more quickly that it's not their fault and they will know more quickly that they can ask, ask for help and have support. Um, so even though it's not something that we want to do, I guess as a parent or even as a social worker, because it's kind of taking away the innocence of young people, to tell them about the bad things that may happen in life. Uh, but I think we actually protect them when we are being truthful to them, obviously with words that are adapted to their, their age. Um, but I think we need to tell them people about these things so they can be more aware that uh, it can happen and even to know how they can support someone if they know someone who goes through that. Yeah. Absolutely. Thank you, Caroline. I'll pass it to my colleague. I don't know if, do you have any more, Sabri? Yes, I do. Okay. Um, on a une question, déjà, so we have a question when it comes to your book. Is there an English translation coming? Well, we would like that. We have a literary agent uh, who has been promoting the book, but we don't have anything signed yet. But I would love for it to be translated as well as uh, my publisher also. So we're, we're having the talks. So another question. So during an intervention, when a black woman refuses to talk to the police uh, due to uh, fear or lack of confidence or fear of her uh, immigration status, you know, because uh, it's true that there is discrimination coming from police uh, towards uh, black survivors. So what should we do in those cases? What advice can you give us? Well, my reflex uh, with any survivor is that if they don't want to talk to the police, I would respect that choice or I would wait for the person to be ready to do so. And if she's ready to do so, I would try and accompany her. But I don't think it's a good idea to push a person to complain to police because if she doesn't want to do so, there are reasons. It's sure we can explore the reasons why not, but we can't assume what the reasons are, but never force someone to speak to the police if they don't want to, regardless of what happened, because it could be very traumatizing to be forced to do something we didn't want to do originally. And if she's ready to do it, let's make sure she wants to do it. And sometimes it's a confidence thing because the finality means that someone might end up in jail. And sometimes that's why somebody doesn't want to go to the police. It's not that they don't trust the police. That could be something, yes. But often it's because, uh, or sometimes it's because the person doesn't want to cause problems for the aggressor. And sometimes that's why the person refuses to uh, complain to the police. It's not always a lack of trust, you know, because if it's someone we know, 
who uh, was responsible for the sexual violence. Sometimes it's someone in the family, there could be related issues with that. And I think we have to respect as much as possible the person's choice. And uh, let's try and see if there's something else we can do in the meantime, and let's wait for that person to be ready, but let's never force them to. Thank you very much, Caroline. Adjaragone, last question? Yes, and this is the final one on my end. Um, so you've spoken a lot around, um, you know, I mean, this presentation is really geared towards Black women. So, and I think you've also spoken and highlighted things on intersection intersectionality. So the question really is, um, how can we ensure this, this Me Too movement remains inclusive and that uh, it's intersectional and it's addressing the concerns of Black women? I, I appreciate you talking about, you know, young um uh, speaking to them from a young age, you know, doing an upstream approach. Uh, but how can we maintain this, that it continues that way, whether research or practice? Mm -hmm. um, so I think for the Me Too movement to remain inclusive, I think we need to keep in mind, uh, that's something that Tarana Burke says all the time also, uh, Me Too is not a plot against men. It's really a movement against sexual violence. And that includes any survivor, like even men who have experienced sexual violence. Um, so I think we need to frame this movement as really a fight to make sure that we there's no longer sexual violence in our world. It's an ambitious goal, but I think that's the vision that she has for this movement. It's really to make sure that nobody ever has ever to experience this. And, and if it does happen, how can we support that person towards a, a feeling of justice, regardless of what shape it takes? Um, so yeah, I think it's, yeah, it, I, I think we should always learn also how to support someone who has experienced sexual violence, because whether we know it or not, we are surrounded by survivors, um, even if it's not something that's being said uh, openly, but we're, we are all surrounded by survivors, because when you look at the numbers of people who have experienced this, for me, it's a public health crisis, for me, it's really like a pandemic, honestly. So we're always surrounded by survivors. So it's important to be mindful about how we talk about this movement, how we talk about survivors, because sometimes your friend might have experienced this and you might not know it. And if you talk really badly about Me Too or the movement, your friend might not feel comfortable coming to you the moment that she will feel ready to talk about it. Um, so I think, yeah, just to keep in mind that we're, we're always surrounded by survivors. Um, and yeah, to to because it's it's more probable. Like I said, like we talk something about false accusations against men, but I really think that men are more susceptible, more likely to be victims of sexual violence than to be falsely accused. So this movement is really for everyone. Um, it's not something against men. So I don't know if I answered the question correctly, but that's how I would answer it. Well articulated. Thank you. Thank you. Sabri? Well, that's all the time we have for today. Thank you very much, Caroline, for joining us today. Thank you to all the participants to this webinar. Thank you as well to the uh, English interpreters, Peter and Sylvie. <laughs> Please note that uh, after the webinar, um, survey will open up, an assessment survey will open up in your navigate in your um, browser. Please fill it in. Thank you from the team. Goodbye. <laughs>